you were previously introduced to the organisation of a DRAM dual inline memory module, or DIM for short. A typical PC motherboard has four DIM slots, so you can install up to four at once. A typical DIM has one rank of eight chips on one face of the circuit board. Some DIMs have more than one rank. Often a second rank is located on the opposite face of the circuit board. Each chip contains multiple banks, and each bank contains multiple arrays. Each array is made up of multiple rows and columns. In this video, you'll learn more about the hierarchical organisation of a DIM and how it operates. You'll also learn about some of the factors that memory designers have to consider when striking a balance between capacity, speed, energy efficiency and cost. First of all, let's consider how a DIM interacts with the processor. A DIM is plugged into a slot on the computer's motherboard, which in turn is connected to the computer's memory controller via a memory channel. The memory controller of a modern PC is integrated into the same chip as the CPU. The memory channel includes an address bus, a command and control bus, and a data bus. These are drawn onto the motherboard. Typically, 17 lines carry the memory address. These lines are used to deliver a row address and a column address separately, meaning we can have larger memory addresses than 17 bits alone would allow. Six lines of the memory channel carry command and control signals, and 64 lines carry the data itself. If the data bus supports error correction, it may well be 72 bits wide rather than 64. The memory channel of an early PC had only 32 lines for the data bus, so a typical memory module of the day had only a 32-bit connection to the motherboard. These were known as single inline memory modules, or SIMs for short. In an early PC, data moved around the computer 32 bits at a time. 32 bits, that's 4 bytes, was known as a word. The memory channel of a modern PC has a 64-bit data bus. So a modern memory module has a 64-bit data connection, twice as much as a SIM. That's why a modern memory module is referred to as a dual inline memory module, or DIM for short. The word size of a modern PC is 64 bits. The effective frequency of the memory channel is typically 2132 MHz. That means 2,132,000,000 new 64-bit words can be transmitted every second, less than half a nanosecond per word. More about how the DIM can keep up with this in a moment. If there are, say, two DIMMs installed, and they both share the same memory channel, the memory is said to be working in single channel mode. If, on the other hand, each of two DIMMs has its own memory channel, then the memory controller can access them simultaneously. This is called dual channel mode. It theoretically makes accessing the memory twice as fast, which can make a real difference to some applications. If there are four DIMMs installed, and each has its own memory channel, this is called quad-channel mode. Some high-end gaming PCs offer this capability. Being able to utilise multiple channels simultaneously depends on the design of the motherboard and the capabilities of the CPU. Most modern PCs offer dual-channel mode. It should be noted that there are power constraints on how many DIMMs can share one memory channel. Channel signals are weakened when split between multiple DIMMs. Typically, a maximum of two DIMMs can share one channel. Bear in mind also that if a single DIMM has two ranks, these ranks are bound to share the same memory channel because they share the same slot. Dual and quad rank DIMMs may have a higher capacity, but they demand more power and offer little extra in terms of speed. Accessing an individual memory cell is a relatively slow process. Reading or writing just one bit of data takes several clock cycles. But the data bus of a memory channel can transfer two new 64-bit words in every clock cycle, once on the rising edge and once on the falling edge. This is where the term double data rate, DDR, comes from. 
A memory module is therefore constructed in such a way as to keep the data bus fully occupied for as much of the time as possible. Each chip on a typical DIM is wired to eight lines of the data bus. This means eight bits of a 64-bit word is read from or written to each of eight chips simultaneously. Eight chips is typical, but some DIMMs have more and some have less. Assume for a moment that a single chip has a fixed capacity, then more chips means more storage. But because the chips work together to service a read or write request, more chips would use more power. Fewer chips, on the other hand, would use less power, but each chip would have to handle a bigger share of 64 data lines. Fewer chips, therefore, means more data pins per chip, and pins are expensive. Inside each chip, there are typically eight banks, each of which can store eight bits. Banks at equivalent positions inside the chips share the same address lines and the same control signals. So when eight bits are written to each chip simultaneously, they are written to banks in equivalent positions. But being able to read or write 64 bits all at once isn't any faster than reading or writing just one bit. To see how to speed things up, let's take a look inside a single bank. This bank contains eight arrays, each with 64 memory cells arranged in eight rows and eight columns. Of course, this is just a model. A typical array will be rectangular and might have 1,024 columns and 16,384 rows. To read some data, first the row address is stroked, which initiates the read cycle, followed by the column address. Together, the row and column address identify a particular cell in each array. These eight cells are in the same position because they share the same row and column address. The row is activated and latched into the sense amplifiers. This is a relatively slow part of the read cycle. At this point, the row is said to be open. Now, one bit from each array can be simultaneously loaded into the output buffer. Remember, this is just a model. A DRAM with eight chips will have a bank in each chip doing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. Between them, they deliver a 64-bit word to the output buffer. Since only one row at a time can be open, early types of DRAM would now close the row and another would be opened if necessary, or this one would be reopened. But opening a whole row which in reality might be 1,024 columns wide, or even double that, just to read one bit, is a waste of time, so to speak. So, while the row is already open, another byte can be read into the output buffer, then another, and another. In other words, a burst of data can be read very quickly by supplying just one row address and one column address. The number of columns read while the row is open is called the burst length. Different generations of DRAM have different burst lengths. Typically DDR2 has a burst length of 4, DDR3 has a burst length of 8, and DDR4 has a burst length of 16. Don't forget, what you can see here is just one bank. In reality, a DDR3 DRAM module will have a bank in each of 8 chips working simultaneously to deliver eight 64-bit words in very close succession. This technique is called prefetching. But there's still a problem. Only one row per bank can be open at any one time. As soon as a burst has finished, the row has to be closed before another can be opened. This involves refreshing the cells of the row that has just been read, then pre-charging the bit lines again. This might take as many as 18 clock cycles. Furthermore, data move between the CPU and the DRAM in blocks known as cache lines. A cache line is typically 64 bytes in size. That's eight 64-bit words. One burst from a modern DIM may be able to fill a single cache line as quickly as the data bus can carry it. But what if multiple cache lines need to be read in close succession? To increase the throughput of a DIM, each bank inside one chip is designed to operate independently 
of the other banks in the same chip. This means different banks can be at different stages of their read or write cycles. A simplified model of one of the banks inside a chip illustrates a system known as bank interleaving. As soon as one bank has delivered a burst, another burst can begin immediately from the next bank, and then the next, and then the next. While one bank is pumping out data, the others can be getting ready to do it again. By the time the last bank in this chip has completed a burst, the first bank has had plenty of time to recover. Bank interleaving, therefore, allows the data bus to operate at very high speeds and, most importantly, to remain saturated during prolonged read and write operations. This chip has eight banks, but some chips have more and some have less. Deciding how many banks to include inside a chip is an important decision that DRAM designers have to make. More banks offer more parallelism and lower latency, so more banks are better at keeping the data bus busy more of the time. More banks means faster memory. But there is something of a balancing act to be performed here. For a given area of silicon, more banks means smaller banks. This in turn might mean smaller arrays and more of them. Each array has its own peripheral components, such as decoders, sets amplifiers and multiplexers. If you want to build a DRAM with the highest possible storage capacity, you need to minimise the number of supporting components and leave as much physical space as you can for storage cells. Ultimately then, more banks means lower capacity. Fewer banks, on the other hand, means larger banks and therefore larger arrays. Potentially, this means higher capacity. But larger arrays have longer bit lines, which are slower than smaller ones and consume more power. 